I'm Judy Murray, and I'm often asked, what is a driving force? Well, it's something or someone who has the power to make things happen. I've seen firsthand just how far we've come in terms of leveling the playing field for female sports, and yet we still have so much ground to cover. On this journey, I'll meet some of our most successful sports stars from football, rugby, netball, athletics, boxing, horse racing and motor racing and hear stories of dedication, determination, resilience and exceptional skill. My aim is to look at where we've come from, where we are now and at what the future holds. If you can see it, you can be it. Conversations around footballing greats tend to centre around male players, Pele, Maradona, Ronaldo. But the women's game has been played for a very long time and has lots of superstars of its own. I'm going to meet Eni Aluko, who has played for Chelsea, Juventus and England. She's also one of the strongest voices against discrimination in her sport. And along the way, I'm going to find out what's happening in the world of women's football and what's being done to level the playing field. 20, 30 years ago, maybe growing up, you would have been ridiculed, probably, if you were a woman playing football. You'd been stereotyped. The trick in what we're trying to do is just getting eyes on the game. We hadn't achieved anything at Chelsea. I'd barely started. We were the worst team in the country. She journeyed from the very beginning to see Chelsea go from the bottom of the pile to the top of the pile. I think when people look back at Eni's story, they'll go, wow, she took on the powers that be and she won. She knew back then what a lot of us didn't know. We did the right things necessary for it to be, you know, taken care of. So when any raised the thing and there was an, another situation with Drew Spence as well, there was never a doubt in my mind that I was going to help them in any way that I could. I didn't appreciate the sacrifice, the boundaries, the obstacles, the sexism that came with being involved in women's sport. Every time you're going to go higher or achieve greater things, you're going to face challenges. And this is what I remind her. So don't be exasperated. Just try and focus on what the problem is. She had ambitious ideas. She recognised what having a dual career in football and education has done for herself. My grandfather always used to say to us, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. The question is, are you prepared to work for it? I firmly believe that especially young black girls can look up and go, there's somebody that looks like me. That is a powerful thing. Welcome to Driving Force, Eni Aluko. Thank this you. This is a fabulous footballing story. Can't <laughs> wait to hear it. Can we go back to your growing up in Birmingham and your earliest memories of family and where you first got into football? Yeah, so I grew up um, in an area called Kings Norton. Me and my brother, who's two years younger than me, we used to just play out every day. I just remember really fond memories of playing out with boys. I happened to be the only girl in the area, so my quickest way of being accepted amongst the group was uh, to play football. I realised actually that it was like a God-given gift. Pretty quickly I was better than the boys, I was dribbling around them, I was faster than them. And so I became sort of quite accepted quite quickly. It's given me everything that's good in my life, really, football. The estate that we lived in had lots of kids, mostly boys, and Annie started, you know, they, she and her brother started going outside to play. First of all, it, it, it made them so happy, it made them so confident, because everybody wanted them to come out. If they didn't come out, football wasn't on. I really wanted to just be one of the boys, and so I told them to call me Eddie um, rather than Any didn't want anything to make me stand out. My mom actually, I would have understood if she was like, who's Eddie, you know, the boys knocking on the door asking for Eddie. But my mom just let me play, you know, and I'm very grateful for that because that encouragement to just 
allow my gift to flourish, it allowed me to just keep playing. Whereas I think a lot of parents sometimes stop their kids too early and they don't go on to become what they could become. Anything that Annie does, or her brother, or her siblings, that shows that, that makes them feel confident, I'm in it. I love it, I like to see children blossom confidently. She even let you have the Eric Cantona and Ryan Giggs posters in the bedroom. Yes, she did, she did. I was a massive Man United fan when I was younger. I used to try and imitate gigs in the garden. Growing up in the 90s, there was no f women's football on TV. The only women's sport on TV was tennis. And so the Williams sisters were my closest role models, really, as black women playing sport. I didn't see anyone like me in, in the game. I asked my mom to have beads in my hair, like the Williams sisters, and I tried tennis for a little bit, but I wasn't as good at tennis as I was at There's football. There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> I know a good coach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, can you go, to me? As time went on, uh, she got noticed at school. They took her into the boys' team, so it was obvious that Annie was... Uh, she had exceptional ability. When, when I went to um, school tournaments and I'd be the only girl, I'd hear parents say, well, where's the rules that allow girls to play? What, what, you know, why is a girl playing? And it's only now that I realised, it's because I was very good and probably better than their sons, that they were angry. It wasn't nice to hear at the time and, and I remember feeling like, is this worth it? Is, is it worth me feeling sad and upset and a bit rejected? It was the first time I'd felt kind of rejection. Like any growing up, I, I played with boys on my estate and I had a few boys that, you know, wanted to come after me a bit and hit me hard and kind of teach me a lesson, sort of like, you know, welcome, can you hack it? Can you, you, can you um, keep up with us? The problem was when I played against another team, they would say some horrific comments. I think it's because they, they knew I was good and they didn't want a girl to be better than a boy. That's why I always felt like I used to get fouled a lot. My legs would be cut up, bruises and stuff like that. But I used to just get back up again and think, oh, it's just a foul. Not realising some players were actually targeting me at such a young age based upon their parents saying stuff on the sideline to them, you know, don't let her get past you, she's a girl. Women's football, because it wasn't visible, because it wasn't something that was normal, a lot of people just felt like it's something girls shouldn't be doing. And as I said, my mom was always super encouraging and actually really protective of me. There was a lot of uh, resistance from people. And there were those as well who, who just thought it was maybe too liberal to let a girl play with boys or to let a girl, you know, play football. But if you see an opportunity, and you can get the opportunity, you need to keep running with it. At what point did you find an all-girls team to play in? I played with boys up until the age of 12, and then I found a, a girls team called Leafield Athletic. I remember rocking up to the training. We had all the same kit, and I was like, wow, you know. It was nice to see that other girls played football. I didn't feel as, as strange. I didn't feel kind of um, the odd one out anymore. That was part of my identity, the girl that plays football. Something else came into your life that was a book called To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> yes. And Atticus Finch sent you in a completely different direction for a while. Yes. School was really important. And in year nine, at the start of my GCSEs, To Kill a Mockingbird was part of the, was the book we had to study in English literature. The persona of Atticus Finch is the lawyer that was speaking up for Boo Radley and an innocent man and all of that just really resonated with me. And that's, I think that's when I started thinking, I, I'd love to be a lawyer. It kind of opened, opened up my eyes to what law was all about. I started reading up about human rights. I watched a lot of police dramas as well, just justice. I, I, really, I really resonated with justice and fairness. She did not miss one episode of The Bill. She liked the bill, she liked the police, she liked everything that had to do with order and energy and physicality and I, I couldn't get it. She told me once, she like, oh, she'd love to be a policewoman, she likes this person and this person at the bill and, oh dear, well, um. <laughs> I remember speaking to a careers advisor at school and I remember saying I, I want to become, I want to be a lawyer and she was kind of like, well, 
why don't you think about something else? You know, why don't you think about just other more sort of traditional career paths for women? And I felt I was being boxed. You know, for me as a young black girl trying to go into a sort of more traditional career, it was just, it was a bit odd for her to kind of fathom it. That was, I think, a moment where I was like, well, even though it's not seen, even though it's not something that's typical, I'm going to do it anyway. And so my, my life really has been a, a series of being the first to do it or doing something that necessarily hasn't been done before. And, and I think that's part of my purpose, really. I read law, I did it at Brunel, I loved it. It was really tough because at the time I was semi-pro, I was playing at Chal Charlton. So, you know, I didn't have the normal university experience going out raving. I, I kind of probably went to a club once in three years because <laughs> I was either in the gym or I was in the library. But I think that's what it takes. When you got your first class law degree, you found it difficult to find a job? I started applying to lots of like magic circle firms and in London and just rejection after rejection after rejection. But I think it redirected me because then I, I went to America to play professionally. We had the World Cup in 2007 mm -hmm. and then the Women's League in America started 2008 and so I was kind of scouted by the Americans in 2007 at the World Cup. And the first club I played for was St. Louis Athletica and it was owned by a lawyer. And he said to me in the off season, I'd love you to work for my firm. So actually, in a way, those rejections led me to my first job, playing professional football and, and working as a lawyer in the off season. That team folded and then I had to move to Atlanta. And then the owner traded me, which is kind of a unique concept in England because the player will always have a say but I just kind of got traded without really being asked and really being told. So I didn't like that element of it, that the fact that I didn't have any control over my own destiny. In the United States, the players are contracted to the United States, the equivalent of the FA, and that go out to the clubs. In this country, the clubs contract the players and we borrow them. <laughs> So it, that relationship between club and country is very critical here. And, and most importantly, player welfare. The players' welfare and physical condition and playing skills are developed in continuously, as opposed to they're in the club and then they come to something completely different. That continuation is really key. I left in 2011. The 2012 Olympics was coming up. So it was kind of a good excuse to be like, OK, I've done America. I'm now ready to go back home. And then I got into the GB squad for 2012, and that was just a watershed moment for women's sport in this country. Uh, and that's when it just, everything changed. When I think back to 2012 and the impact that that had on women's sport, it was, it was huge. We, for football and across all sport, focused as much on the women and and the men, and that's something I'm very proud of that we did, and it was right that we did that. Coming up next on Driving Force. We had 75,000 people watching women's football. I think it was the biggest platform female football had been put on. It really changed everything. She journeyed with myself along with others from the very beginning to see Chelsea go from the bottom of the pile to the top of the pile. I think my whole life up until that point, football was kind of the world. It was like, you know, a bubble. But the Olympics is so much bigger than one sport. So it really kind of put into perspective football for me and it put, put into perspective what it takes to get to the top and I was ex we were exposed to it. It was just an incredible experience. I remember being at the Olympic Village and I walked into a lift and Mo Farah was in the lift and I was like, oh my God, it's Mo Farah. We were both in the same kit, so we felt like teammates. 2012 was massive for all of us. I get like get anxious about talking about it and, and seeing it because if it wasn't home games, I don't think you know I would have been capable of you know winning two gold medals with the home lift. 
often I see kids and stuff on and like, well, my kids got into running because of 2012, that Super Saturday, and that could be never forgotten. It was history and, and legacy, I guess, we left behind. 50% of the sport managers that I had in my team were, were women. It was the first time that 50% of the, of the athletes had been female, and it, it was a step change I'm very proud of. The, the football manager that I had was a female, and she did an, an, an amazing job. And when we, we saw the crowds that were turning out for, for women's football, you knew that that could be a springboard to the future. Two days ahead of the opening ceremony, Team GB's women footballers kick it all off against New Zealand. It was the best experience of my coaching career, bar none. We had 75,000 people watching women's football, and it was like, wow. These people have come to watch this sport, this game, it's got to be a platform. I think it was the biggest platform female football had been put on. It certainly put the women's game out there visibly for you know, young girls growing up to, to, to think that you know, one day they could maybe be a professional footballer. You had to be in a moment and I felt like we were all in this moment where we just, we wanted to be present for each other. The legacy that I think it would have left is that it showed you know, just how far what we can aspire to within our sport and, and then also inspire the young generations to want to represent GB one day, put that shirt on and go one step further than we were able to. I remember that squad 2012. I put it on, I watched it and it made me pick up my boots again. So I just think about, you know, all the other girls that watched that squad and got inspired and wanted to be a part of football. Um, and that's what it's all about, I think you know, for the next generation, inspiring them and just showing them that, like, sky is the limit. That was a vital, vital moment for our country. And it was a vital moment to say to the Football Association, we had packed stadiums, the game was banned, they're back again. You have got to take this seriously. And nothing is taken more seriously than money and capacity and tickets and ticket sales. It really changed everything and I think the, the country then started to really respect women's football. Professional clubs started investing more. Professional teams like Chelsea, Manchester City, Arsenal, they started investing in the women's teams. And so professional contracts came in. So I was offered a professional contract um, at Chelsea. I remember hearing so much desire and determination to want to be a part of the project that I was putting together. We hadn't achieved anything at Chelsea. I'd barely started. We were the worst team in the country. So for her to, to see that vision line with what, what I did, I thought it was a brave move from her, but one that she journeyed with myself along with others from the very beginning to see Chelsea go from the bottom of the pile to the top of the pile. That was the start of an, a very, very successful period in my career lots of trophies, you know, winning the FA Cup, winning the league, and just being part of an amazing group of people and group of players that really went on to do really great things. Eddie Aluko scores! Yeah, lovely ball through, Aluko! It's Aluko, 2-0. There's the cushion Chelsea wanted. It was genuinely a sea change in a lot of people's lives and careers, the, the Olympics. There, I think, is the beginning of a body of 10 years of work that has put the women's game in the strong position that it is and has made our league the leading league in the world. It's Miedemar onto that right front, catches out the goalkeeper. Class, that is outstanding, a worldie. And what a cool finish. The champions level. And it is raised a lot. After six years at Chelsea, I, um, I kind of was like, I want to retire here. That, that, you know, Chelsea was home. It still is home. I support the team. But I think that when you're part of a successful team, it's really competitive and it does become quite ruthless in a way because then you're always striving to get better. So there was always new players coming in and then you sort of become less relevant. And he's always had huge aspirations to achieve at the highest levels. Not everybody can be on the winning team. 
but any will always make sure she will do everything she can to try to be. I went to Juventus and it was just a great experience for me because it really pushed me outside of my comfort zone. I learned Italian and then I traveled around Italy. Juventus with a beautiful piece of play. Juventus was one of the biggest clubs in the world and actually I joined a day before Ronaldo. So at the time when I arrived in Turin, it, was, it felt like the biggest club in the world because the best player in the world had just joined. So it was a really good time to join and I think they really wanted to maximise a lot of the marketing around the women's team as a result of that. So literally I'm driving around and I see myself on a billboard with Ronaldo and Dybala, you know, two of the greatest players for Juventus and it just showed how far women's football had come. We've sort of, we've got to a point now where people are thinking differently. There is a lot that's happening all around elevating, ele elevating women's game. There's a huge momentum. So I'm, I'm very, very optimistic about where we are. I went to a World Cup in 2019. It was on every channel, it was on BBC, prime time. We got 11.8 million for a game. We have to get the players out there, we have to get them noticed, we have to get them on the television. Then they can start being heroes. You can't think about doing something unless you see somebody doing it before you. But what you want is that it's just the norm. And that will only happen with increased broadcasting. And that is the key. The, the trick in, in, in what we're trying to do is just getting eyes on the game. You know, that's, that's, that's why the broadcast deal we've now got with BBC and Sky is just phenomenal. That's what inspires them. The big job for us is to make sure there's an opportunity once they're inspired. So our job at the Football Association is to make sure that inspiration's turned into participation. In terms of participation in football, yeah, I think 20, 30 years ago, maybe growing up, you would have been ridiculed, probably. If you were a woman playing football, you'd been stereotyped. But now I think the acceptance of, of, of women's football and the fact that participation levels are up, the fact that the quality of the game, the fact that it's accepted, at least is a step forward. I firmly believe that, that especially young girls, in my case, young black girls, can look up and go, there's somebody that looks like me if that inspires more girls to get involved and believe that they could have a career, that is a powerful thing. All of us have put so much hard work in, not for financial gain, we love the game. And, you know, I would have earned more money being a lawyer, you know, but I wanted to play football. And so when you see yourself on a billboard like that, it's like, oh, it was worth it. You know? I often hear that about women in sport, that that we do it for the passion, not the paycheck. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's the beauty of the sport. And we've got to try and keep that, that honesty to the game. I used to pay to play. I used to pay five pounds to play. I'm not suggesting we still do that, but we always did it for the love of the game. And now we do it to inspire young girls to continue playing. So we've got to, we've got to try and keep that um, honesty for the game whilst the, you know, lots of money is coming in. We are not a normal type of football club. The decision in 2017 to split revenue equally between the men's side and the women's side uh, was designed to make sure that football was genuinely for all. And yet we were the first club in the world to do that. And I think we still are. Anytime I can, on match day, even when it's very, very stressful, I will always want to take a moment to watch the mascots walking out onto the pitch with our players. It just gives me the chills sometimes to see these seven, eight, nine-year-old girls walking out and they look at the players as though they are absolute heroes. Well, they are heroes. And I can't help but think, wow, I wish I had that when I was growing up. Maya, what position do you play? Striker. And what is it that you love about being a striker? Scoring goals. Goal! What a goal! Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Girls, that was so much fun. I, I feel a new career coming on. You taught us some tricks there. I think I have a future in there. <laughs> you were saying, Rian, that 
when you were growing up, there was literally one female role model who yeah. had a career in football. Now there are literally hundreds. Mm. How important is that? You can only be what you, you can see. Until I came to Lewis, I never really saw myself as a role model. Just walking through town, like the whole community, like you walk past young girls and they recognise you as a player of Lewis FC. Um, and I think it's just really important that, that we take that role and, and we embrace it and enjoy it because, yeah, who knows, in, in 20 years they might be taking our shit, so. <laughs> what would you remember of Enya Luko as a player? Uh, she was my role model when I was growing up and playing. Um, if she wasn't there as a role model, would I be here today? I, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I'll be playing football um, and carried on to as long as I have. So it's so important because, like Avian said, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. There's more to scoring goals or winning games, I think. Just being a voice and, and standing up for what is right, um, I think is so important. And that's even more important as a role model for all of us girls growing up, yeah. Coming up next on Driving Force. I was being treated differently to other senior players in the team who were white. You know, we're told by other generations before us who had different challenges, keep quiet. She knew back then what a lot of us didn't know. There's other players who were white and they would get away with it. footballer who's accused the national team manager of discrimination has given her first TV interview. The striker Enia Luko claims she was dropped after speaking out in what she thought was a confidential review about alleged racial and prejudicial remarks made by manager Mark Sampson. He's been cleared of any wrongdoing in both an FA review and an independent investigation. He asked me, who's coming to watch the game for you? And I said, oh, I've got family coming in from Nigeria, actually. I've got family flying in. And he said, um, make sure they don't come over with Ebola. That experience was probably the most difficult time of my life. I'd been in the England team nine years at the time when Mark Sampson joined the team as coach. Um, so I was an established senior player in the team and I was being treated differently to other senior players in the team who were white. And not just me, there, there was other black and mixed race players in the team who I just felt there's something not right here. And it's really hard to explain because I think people see racism as name calling. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's being treated unfavorably in comparison to other people that don't look like you. And it's, sometimes it's a look, sometimes it's a feeling. Did others notice it? Uh, yeah, we talked about it. We talked about it, but you know, this is the thing about professional sport, you get on with it. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to play, so... And ironically, at the time, it was probably the best period of my career because I was channeling a lot of frustration on the pitch, scoring goals, and I was like, it was my way of kind of like, I'll show you. To the naked eye, people thought, oh, she's doing really well, but actually it was quite a miserable period. Within many communities, um, we are so used to the racism, we're so used to the mistreatment that we experience that we just accept things. You know, we're told by other generations before us who had different challenges, keep quiet, play the game, keep in there. In terms of like calling that out, it, it kind of took a while because it wasn't like it is now where, you know, conversations about racism are a lot more kind of open. If you look at a Raheem Sterling, for example, who came after Eni Aluko, by the way, that's somebody who again said, I'm not, I'm not going to stand for this. I'm not going to keep quiet. I'm not going to play the game. I'm going to talk about my rights. I'm going to let others know that they should also step forward if they feel that they should do. Um, and we're going to make an impact. And that's what Eni was about. Eni was about making an impact. When that was said, did you challenge him at the time? Did you say that's unacceptable? No, I, I laughed. I, la I laughed because, I mean, I was in shock. I, di I didn't know, you know, I didn't know um, what to say. The FA asked me to be part of a kind of cultural review. And it was really strange because at the time I was like, well, this is really ironic because I've been feeling this for a long time and now I have a platform to share it mm -hmm. confidentially. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was asked to be part of this cultural review, I was honest and I, mm -hmm. I kind of felt like I was in a safe space to do so. And then I got dropped from the team about 10 days later. And just that timing didn't feel right. It's hard when you're a player because you just want to play football and your priority is to play, but she knew back then what a lot of us didn't know. Probably all of us as players 
didn't appreciate the work she tried to do for us as a teammate back then. But it's really helped the team now uh, and where they're at now in what she did behind the scenes and probably, I'm not saying it played a part in, in, in where she ended up in terms of not being selected, but it could have contributed towards it. How was it broken to you that you were dropped from the England team after all those years and in great form? I was told at Chelsea by Mark Sampson. At the time, it was called sort of online s behaviour. Um, and it was sort of, you don't, you know, you don't fit what I see as capable of being an England player. And it wasn't football related, so it was really odd because I was like, well, what behaviour are you talking about? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. I think where the racism comes in is, is there's other players who were white who could, you know, be angry or be upset about a decision or show anger and they would get away with it. Every time you're going to go higher or achieve greater things, you're going to face challenges. And this is what I remind her. So don't be exasperated. Just try and focus on what the problem is. It became public because it was leaked and then it, that's when it became really difficult. Before I could even get to the head or the tail of it, it was something that was in the news pretty much every other day. And I was uneasy myself about it, like, oh my goodness, you know, um, keep it to absolutely what you must. But the important thing was that she was able to say, this is happening and I don't mind if it costs me my England career. Why speak out now? I, I feel that there's a lot of half-truths out in the public, and I think it's in the public interest now to understand the severity of this case, to understand that this isn't something I decided to fabricate out of the blue. This wasn't a bitter, impassioned revenge at an England manager. I believe it was an unfavourable comment made to me to, that made me feel completely shocked and intimidated, that was said to me because I'm of African descent. If we don't risk the things that are most important to us, racism will continue and it will get worse. Courage um, and tenacity is required. Our grandparents did it, our parents did it, and look at where we are today. It's not necessarily where we would like to be in the end, but we're getting there. It was really unpleasant, but actually now, sat here today, I look, at, I look back at it and say, well, it was part of my purpose. Culturally, it changed the team, changed the way people view racism in football um, and how to deal with racism in football. And um, it needed to happen. Did you find that you got support from your teammates over this incident? Um, at the time, no. Certainly not publicly. And I think, actually, it was a reflection of where women's sport was. All of the contracts of the players were owned by the FA. The FA paid the players more than the clubs did. So regardless of what people felt or thought in support of me, they couldn't say it. Mm -hmm. And actually, up until that point, anybody who had, who had an opinion, who spoke out, including me, had lost their contract. That was the culture. We did the right things necessary for it to be, you know, taken care of. So when any raised the thing, and there was an, another situation with Drew Spence as well, there was never a doubt in my mind that I was going to help them in any way that I could. There are still players playing on that team now that I know are only playing based upon previous situations. And there's players like myself, any Drew, that never really got, yeah, got given an opportunity in England. I can't say I've never been given an opportunity, but never really given that opportunity to take it to another level like some players have. And that's the truth. It's very cool to have those conversations now. Mm. It's very topical. I was kind of having it when it wasn't cool. <laughs> it was really difficult to be kind of the only one saying, no, this is not acceptable. But if it meant that I had to be the first or the only one at the time, and it became sort of more open, then I'm happy with that. If it wasn't for any, this would never have reached the select committee. It would never have led to the deep questioning that has led to the brilliant diversity initiatives now happening at the Football Association. With anti-racism campaigns in football, we know there are many, there's, you know, Kick It Out, the Show Racism Red Card, all of that 
can't work unless there is simultaneous action. People are trying. You can't fault people for the amount of effort they've put in recently. You know, taking the knee is something that is quite strong. I know how I feel when I see it. But I do think for some players that are there, they've decided they don't want to take the knee anymore because they feel like it's only, you know, they're not seeing anything change. We must want real um, effective change to happen. Um, and for that effective change to happen, it must actually hit people in the pockets. Because right now, if you look at the football community in, in Europe and in the US, it's mostly platitudes. No effective change has actually happened. But if you, if you hit these owners in the pocket where it actually hurts, that's when effective change will actually happen. But before then, I think we'll continue talking about you know, racial justice for years to come. My feeling when I was a player and we used to wear the kick it out t-shirts, I used to, it used to always make me really, really angry that once a year we just wear a t-shirt, kick it out. My, my feeling was, what we're doing every single day, we can, we can have a go at Serbia and Russia and, and all these countries where it gets highlighted probably more, but we've got a massive problem in our country with racism and we need to tackle it more than what we do. Until we have diversity and inclusion at the top, top level, you're never gonna get diversity and inclusion at the bottom. We all know that diversity forms better societies. We all know that diversity forms better companies. We all know that diversity fosters better relationships between societies. So why isn't it not being done? Why is it taking so long? My experience is that uh, a well-balanced boardroom is absolutely fundamental to a successful business. And it's not that one is right and one is wrong. It is that it's different. And it's that difference that is the strength. The FA is massively committed to that diversity and inclusion agenda, both in the boardroom and in coaching and in leadership in the game. To have a game that has racism is not to have a game. And sport is built supposedly on equality. So if we truly believe in that, then everybody really needs to rally round and make sure that that is the case. Coming up next on Driving Force. I think that the more that we see just great women doing great things, the more young girls are going to be like, I can do that. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. The question is, are you prepared to work for it? At what point did you decide to call time on your playing career? I'd always kind of been doing other things alongside football, but I always knew that I would have to kind of make a decision. The job offer for Aston Villa came in to become a sporting director. I'd finished my master's in sporting directorship the year before. So I, again, I was kind of setting myself up for life after football anyway. And so when I got that job offer, I thought, right, that's the sign. That's the sign to kind of call it a day and just let go of football. I want to bow out at the top, winning trophies and, and going into another aspect of my life. Joining as a sporting director um, was really the best kind of opportunity for me to learn what the job was all about. You obviously set the direction of the team in terms of the recruitment, the culture, training facilities, all of that but I was able to talk to the marketing team and the sponsorship team and work with the CEO and, and manage budgets and the finance and you know, work on the governance side. It was really multifaceted. The great thing about having Eni as a director at Villa before was that you know, she had ambitious ideas and having a program like Students of the Game it is important because she recognised what having a dual career in football and education has done for herself. And I think she recognises how that can be um, impactful for players in the game now in a professional environment to see beyond their playing days and work ahead to when they might transition. When I got the Angel City opportunity in LA, which is on a much grander scale, I felt very confident that I could do it. It's a really exciting opportunity, I think, to do something special in the women's game that's led by females, that's kind of never been done before. So I'm excited to be part of that. Are there any potential 
drawbacks of having an all-female owned team in terms yeah. of male advocacy? Well, it's 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 female. It's predominantly female owned um, and female led. So the founders are female, but actually one of the um, lead investors is Alexis Ahanian, who is Serena Williams' husband. He's a great example, an incredibly strong advocate for women's sport. I think he watched one female w women's game and was like, I want to buy a football club. And we need people like him. I think it's hugely important for men to be vocalising their support for, for women in sport, but not just women in sport who play the sport, it's about the women behind the sport. We were really keen to partner with Forest Green Rovers because Hannah Dingley is the only female head of academy for the men's team and we're really keen on putting women at the heart of sporting jobs which really helps with female visibility in sport. But how important is it that there are more women in the sporting workforce? Yeah, it's so important. It's so important for visibility, it's so important for the next generation of women and girls to see other women on visible platforms, like in punditry, like in the media, in ownership and leadership. And I think more importantly, it's really important to say, there's one thing to have a gender conversation about women. There's another thing to just say, these are great people. These are, the competencies of these women is incredible. Mm. They're women, but they're just great at their job, full stop. I want to be known as a great pundit. I'm a woman, yes but I'm very good at my job, right? So I, that's what I want to be known for. So I think that the more that we see just great women doing great things, the more young girls are going to be like, I can do that. Welcome to the 10th Soccer A. TV stars, Olympic medalists, Champions League winners. All participants will take the knee. At what point did you start to involve women in soccer aid? I think it was all, we always talked about it. We were always worried, is it also tokenism, which I don't think it is. It's about just equal opportunity and, and girls playing with, with, with guys and having a good time. Soccer aid's one where you've got the, the, the ex-pros and freestylers against celebrities. They can perform as good as each other, really. And there's some really good female players. Freestyle football is essentially dancing on a ball. Because I'm a girl and I'm doing it, it just makes people go crazy. They're like, oh my gosh, how did you do that? A girl is better than a boy. You know, that's not normal. First freestyler and nutmega um, to get on the pitch and being a woman, it's amazing. I remember being 10, 11, and being one pitch for the girls' team and 15 other pitches for the boys. You get to a certain age, and because the money isn't there, like in the men's game, a lot of young women drop out at the age of 16, 17. But then obviously football's come back now, and I'm managing to be here at Soccer Aid, which is just a full 360. One element of UNICEF's work is you know, gender equality, promoting equal rights for children, both girls and boys, and to see that reflected in an event such as okay. Soccer Aid for UNICEF is incredible. We knew that it was, uh, it was time to sort of move on. I always say everybody's equal, everybody's the same, and uh, there's no difference to, 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 to us and, and, and women. If you're, good, if you're a good player, you're a good player. It's as simple as that. Uh, and you're seeing, you're seeing the guys today, how, how good they are, and uh, how involved everybody is together. So, you know, full credit to everybody at Soccer Aid for, you know, for, for doing that. And again, that sends a message to other people also. So I think it's important that someone has to send the message. If you can see it, you can be it. hundred percent. hundred percent. Definitely, if you can see it, you can be it. I think it's important to even draw inspiration from, you know, I didn't see female footballers on TV, but I got inspiration from the Williams sisters and felt I could still do it. Somebody's always got to be the first. Someone's always got to be the first, and, and that's kind of in my life that I've... But I was drawing inspiration from somewhere. Women in so many other industries can be inspiring, even women in sport. If she can do it, if she's an aeronautical engineer, you can do it if you see another woman doing amazing things, if that makes sense. I think that's absolutely right. It's all about breaking the glass ceilings. Yes. In the media space, 
you have positive role models for these girls. You want to re reinforce young girls who are going to grow up to be women, who are going to encourage other women. It has a snowball effect. My grandfather always used to say to us, I don't care, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. The question is, are you prepared to work for it? It's not gonna come to you, so you have to go and get it. I think this is the attitude that we must instill in these young girls. I really take it seriously that kind of what I do is going to inspire other people and, and I think that's a really privileged position to be in. I think when people look back at Annie's story, um, at her journey in years to come, they'll go, wow, she took on the powers that be and she won. What she absolutely will be remembered for is the moment where women's football and women's footballers were taken seriously, not to be underestimated. It shouldn't have taken her ferocious intellect, but wow, what an impact. Respect deserved. Young women, young black women particularly, uh, should, should feel confident that, oh yeah, it's doable. Player, pundit, Absolute boss. Thank goodness <laughs> Thank for so Attica Spinch, that's all I can I say. Know. You're going to achieve so much more. You're Thank an you absolute so inspiration and a role model. And Thank thanks so for much. being with us today. Thank you, Judy. I appreciate it. Thank you.